After installing a few things on our cluster, one question that we could ask ourselves is how much CPU, how much RAM are we using, how much padding space do we have, uh, how much more apps can I deploy on that cluster before it's completely full, and one way to answer that question is to use metrics server. When you have metrics server correctly set up on a cluster, um, we can use kubectl top. You know the top command, you know, on on Unix where you run top and it shows you like this resource usage. Well, kubectl top is similar. We can do kubectl top nodes and kubectl top pods, except at the moment it's telling me metrics API not available because kubectl top relies on the metrics server. So. Uh, we need to install that metric server. Of, of course, we could also install, you know, like a kind of a, a full blown metrics solution, um, either something like Datadog or New Relic, like the agent for these platforms, or we could use a self-hosted solution like Prometheus and spoiler alert, we're going to do that in a moment. But first, we are going to install metrics server. Um, so pros and cons, like what's great and what's not about metrics server. Well, uh, metrics server doesn't have any retention. It's not going to save historic information. You know, it just gives us like instant data. This is how much CPU and RAM we are using right now. Uh, it's also only giving us information about CPU and RAM and nothing else. So you could think, well, that doesn't seem like a great product. Like I, I want to have more information. I want graphs. I want etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Absolutely, and in fact, we we will want both. But the advantages of metric servers are that it's really lightweight. Um, it doesn't require any storage since it's not storing like historical information and it's used by auto-scaling. If at some point you want to have auto-scaling on your cluster, you will need metric server. And so we might as well install that and then later add something you know, more featureful uh, on top of it. So um, how are we going to do that? Um, metric server works in a pretty simple way. It's going to be just a pod running in the cluster. It's going to get metrics from all the nodes, aggregate that and expose that using the Kubernetes API. Um, if you want to dive into the nasty little details, um, metric server is going to register itself with the Kubernetes API aggregation layer. I'm not going to dive into that uh, in this series of videos, but it's pretty interesting stuff, especially if you want to do things like custom scaling, as in like a, uh, auto scaling um, a deployment depending on the latency or auto scaling a worker depending on the amounts of messages or objects in a queue, etc., etc. So, um, how do we install metrics server? Well, if we go to the official instructions, it's going to tell us, hey, here is some YAML. So basically you just, you know, like uh, apply that YAML and, and we're good. Well, except if we apply that YAML, it won't quite work. Like <laughs> um, it won't quite work because it needs a couple of extra options and I'm going to explain why in just a minute. Um, so these are the options that we need right there. And once again, instead of getting the YAML and tuning that YAML and applying it, I'm going to use a Helm chart. And this is going to be again a Helm chart from the very fine folks at Bitnami. All right, so how do we do this? Well, you know the drill now. We are going to call the release metric server. Uh, we're going to install it in the metric server namespace, etc., etc., keeping things boring and predictable. So let's do this. I'm going to copy paste that one. And before I actually uh, engage that command, I'm going to explain uh, the role of these options. So API service dot create that one means that um, metric server is going to register itself with API services like 
API services. What's that? That's basically this thing here. And actually, I'm maybe I can run that in a in a watch loop. Uh, and we're going to take a look once I start uh, the metric server. Um, so that's the that's the, that 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 option is mandatory. Uh, and then these two options here um, indicate how metric server should connect to the nodes when getting the metrics. And we have two options here. That one says you should use the internal IP address of the nodes. Why? Because by default, metric server is going to use the name of the nodes. Uh, okay, let's do like this. Yeah, better. So by default, metric server is going to connect to these names. And for that to work, you need these names to be in some kind of DNS server uh, and to have like all this DNS resolution enabled. And it's not a pretty common scenario. Uh, I haven't seen many Kubernetes clusters where that was the case, and it's definitely not the case here. So we can't connect to just that. So here we're telling metric server, hey, instead of connecting to LKE24321, et etc., et cetera, you know what, just use the internal IP address of the nodes because this is going to work. You know, this is robust, like these IP addresses here. Yep, that works. Now, the second option, um, or the first one, depending on how we look at it, uh, insecure TLS, what is this about? Well, this is because uh, when we use the, um, the internal IP, that internal IP is not present in the certificate used by Kubelet on that node. And I'm like, what? Like, what, what is, what's going on here? What is this about? Well, when, um, when metric server connects to Kubelet, uh, it's connecting to port 10 to 50 uh, of these nodes. So basically, it will connect to that. Uh, at this point, if I want, I can do something like this. And my bad, of course, I'm, uh, I'm outside the cluster, so I cannot use the internal address. Let's use the external address instead. There we go. And I get for now like a 404 page not found. But I think there are some uh, yeah, for instance, I can go to slash metrics or maybe health Z uh, and each time like I get unauthorized because I'm not presenting uh, a valid uh, certificate. All right, but what I want to show you is that um, if I want to look at the certificate uh, used by Kubelet here, so we do this like that. So this is the certificate used by Kubelet. Uh, and what I want to do in particular is decode the entire certificate. So I get that certificate here and I use OpenSSL x509-text. I copy paste that certificate I just got when connecting to Kubelet. And that's the interesting bit. In here, the, the SAN, the subject alternative name contained in the certificate, we can see that we only have a DNS SAN in that certificate. We don't have an IP SAN. Um, and so basically what happens is that when metric server connects to the internal IP, uh, so when it connects to you know 192.168 etc etc it's going to get the equivalent of you know that that warning that you get when you connect to um, an, HTTPS web, an https website without a valid certificate so here we are telling metric server yes i know that the certificates of these kubelet don't exactly match what you expect but give me a break just get the metrics and it will be fine all right, so I'm installing metric server. And when I do that, here, we are going to see 
see here, metrics, metrics server uh, that just got registered. And for now it's, there we go. It, that was really fast. Uh, it took like 15 seconds uh, for metrics servers to start, be up, be ready, be running and accept requests. This is also one of the reasons why we use metrics server here because it's so easy and fast to deploy. All right. Now we can try that kubectl um, top nodes command that I was telling you about earlier. And as you can see, this is telling us um, that we are using like a few percent of CPU, a few percent of memory. How do we read this? Uh, this doesn't mean 2% of CPU core. Uh, this is a percentage of the um, total CPU available in these machines. Um, so for instance, <clears throat> this here means 98 millicores. And I guess outside of Kubernetes, it's not very common to talk about millicores, uh, but in Kubernetes, when we talk about CPU usage, we count that in number of cores. So you know like, oh, this thing is using like three cores or four cores. And of course we need fractional numbers because often something will use less than one core. So this is telling, so 98 millicores, that's 0.1 core, or in, in ways that maybe you're more familiar with, this means on that node, at the moment, we have 10% of one CPU uh, in use. On that one, we have 30% of a CPU. On that one, 10% as well. And that percentage here is like how much that represents over the total number of cores on that node. Uh, so just to insist a little bit, uh, this doesn't mean that I have 2% of one CPU. This means 2% of all the CPUs. And I think it's, in, it's useful to remind that because uh, that contrasts a little bit with top, you know, like in, in top here, when I have 11%, that means 11% of one core. So it's a common thing to have some processes using more than 100% because they are leveraging threads and things like that. So you, for instance, whenever I do some video encoding or things like that, I could have like 200 or 250% CPU because it's uh, using some parallelism. But here, when we do kubectl top nodes, what we see here is the CPU usage compared to the total number of cores. And then here we have the memory usage again, uh, this is in megabytes and this is compared to the total memory amount on that nodes. Awesome. Now we can also use kubectl top pods to see that breakdown uh, in pods. And my favorite, at least on small clusters, I can add a dash dash all namespaces and see uh, all the pods in all the namespaces. Of course, on a big cluster, that would be unwieldy because it would be pages and pages and pages. But right now on our small cluster, uh, that gives us a pretty good idea of what's going on. Uh, we can see that CPU usage is fairly low. Now a word about that memory usage. Uh, that memory usage uh, corresponds more or less to the resident set size. And why is this important? Because the pod actually needs a little bit more than that to work correctly. Uh, the resident set size more or less corresponds to what has been allocated, you know, with uh, malloc and things like that. Uh, but to work, the pod will need also caches, buffers, things like that. So when we look at that, we shouldn't think, oh, that pod just needs like five megs of RAM, that's great. No, it will need a little bit more. So uh, when we look at the um, node metrics, when we look at the node metrics here, we should not aim for 100% because when you get at 100% here, 
uh, your node is really, really full. Imagine like 100% here would be like, let's try to put as many people as we can in that room until they are all kind of shoulder to shoulder and nobody can move. That would be the equivalent of 100% memory usage here. So you don't want that. A more realistic memory target, well, that will depend a lot on the workload that you have. So for instance, if you have workloads that are uh, mostly like CPU bound, you know, they, they load a bunch of things in memory and they crunch them, but they don't do a lot of IO, so they don't need a lot of cache, then yeah, maybe you can push to 90% or something like that. But on the other way, on, on the other hand, if you have workloads with lots of IO, like constantly reading things from disk, etc., and also like network, you need some buffers, then it's a better better idea is to shoot for 50% utilization and of course on, if you have a mixed workload with a little bit of both you will go for something in between. Just keep that in mind again let's not aim for 100% because at 100% things don't work so well. All right so now we have external DNS integration, we have an ingress controller, we have some pretty basic metrics. Uh, let's see how we can have some slightly better metrics uh, and then we will be fully equipped uh, to move on to GitLab itself.